We're beginning a new series uh, tonight entitled Preventing the Dismantling of America. And out of probably anything that I have taught in remembrance uh, in importance, I think this is probably going to be one of the most important series that I've ever taught. In fact, those that listen to it on YouTube or get the DVD, uh, if you watch it online, share the link with other people. Put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter and all the different things. It needs to go viral among the body of Christ. Uh, if you get this on DVD, you have my permission to make a million copies of it and get it out to everyone. Because uh, America is in the crosshairs in many different ways to be taken down. When I was on vacation, I always like to try to use that time to catch up with all the stuff that I normally don't have time to catch up with during the year. And one of the sets that I got was from the Prophecy Club by Lindsay William. It's called The Elite Speak, and it's actually three different DVD sets. Now, if you don't know the story of Lindsay Williams, uh, back in when they were building the Alaska Pipeline, he felt a call of God to go up, and he was a missionary in Alaska, and ended up talking them into allowing him to be a chaplain on the Alaska Pipeline. And by the sovereignty of God, they invited him to be an advisor on the board, and many of the elite of the world were a part of that board that he got to sit and uh, eat with, sit on the boards. He lived with these people. And in this, he details a lot of things that he has discovered. There are several of them that befriended him. So even after he left the three years when he was on the pipeline, uh, they would uh, communicate with him. And he discovered that there's a small handful of people that actually run the planet. And you say, well, that kind of sounds kind of crazy. What they have shared with him, he has a 35-year track record of it coming to pass. There are times they've got to adjust their timelines. There are times that they've got to rework the plan a little bit. But exactly what they have said they're going to do, they have always done. And uh, he has developed a reputation uh, in the body of Christ with what he shares being extremely accurate. Now, uh, if you get this from the Prophecy Club, it uh, does not have copyrights on it on all nine DVDs. He pleads with the body of Christ to make copies of it and disseminate it. And so one of the things that I have done, all of you tonight have a copy of that sitting back there on the back table. Uh, we've also made copies for those who regularly support uh, biblical life. We have went through several spindles of DVDs to make enough copies um, to get it out, and we're going to begin putting these things with it. Now, in listening to him, and, and you guys know that I have studied the Illuminati and some of these groups probably for at least a decade, and it really began to uh, help put a lot of things together. There is a, a small group of individuals that control the world. They control the finances. We call it the international banking system. Uh, most Americans do not know that the Federal Reserve is no more a part of the U.S. government than Federal Express. They're international bankers, which means many of them are not even U.S. citizens, control our money. Not only do they control the money, uh, they control all the oil in the world. OPEC does not really set the price. They do. OPEC does not set how much is going to be pumped. They do. In fact, one of the things that uh, has come out, and I've actually seen some of this on Hannity and on some other uh, commentator news shows, is that the largest oil reserves in the world are not in the Middle East. They're in the continental United States. It's on congressional record that there's four of them that I know of. One is in Alaska that was discovered when uh, Chaplain Williams was up there. It was one of the largest discoveries they had ever made. They have not ever pumped one thing of oil out of it. There's one in the Dakotas, there's one in the Rockies, and, they, and Hannity shared how they had discovered one in the Gulf. Any one of these guys has 20 times the reserves of Saudi Arabia, but they are not allowed to be tapped until they do what they want to do with America, then they'll release the oil. Um, there's not a war on the planet that is not fought, a major war on the planet that is not fought without their approval because they're the ones that have to finance it. 
And so if nation A is going to go against nation B, they go and say, I would like to fight nation B. I need a loan. And as soon as they attack, nation B runs to the same people and says, nation A attacked us. Can we have a loan? And the basic way that it works is no matter which side wins, they've got to pay not only the loans for what they borrowed, but also the nation that they conquered. These people made millions, if not billions of dollars during World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War. Uh, there's even some evidence, listening to other experts, uh, that they tried to bring our nation into debt during the Civil War. Adam, uh, Abraham Lincoln, instead of borrowing money, created something called greenbacks. You can go online and, and study this out. But many speculate that the reason that he was assassinated after the war was not about ending slavery. It's because he did not go into debt to international bankers. Over it, he found a way around it. And so these, these people do not mess around. There's no energy crisis. They control the oil. They simply will not allow it to be pumped. They run the world as a corporation. Now, you and I, we, you know, I, I think I'm really getting uh, uh, evolved in ministry when I'm planning, you know, this is what I got what to do next year or maybe five years from now. These guys run the planet like a corporation, and they will plan 20, 30, and even sometimes 100 years in advance. Uh, there are times that they've got to revise their plans, extend their plans, but they always go back to the plan that they wanted to do to slowly move the world in the direction they wanted to go. And one of the things that they shared with uh, Lindsay Williams, there's only one nation on the planet that has ever stood in their way when it comes to wanting a new world order and a one world currency. There's only one nation that had exceptionalism that kind of got in the way, and it was the United States of America. Now, to render the United States helpless uh, to stop their plan, they had to do several things. Number one, they had to move us away from the Constitution of the United States. Secondly, they had to move America away from the God of the Bible. Now... Over the past 100 years, they have done exactly that. I'm just going to cover some of the things that they have done. Uh, one, at the, at the turn of the 20th century, they were behind the progressive movement. Uh, the progressive movement brought in the Federal Reserve. It brought in something called income tax. Prior to that, there was no such thing as income tax. And it, it's a way of enslaving the people. Just recently, our president, when talking about you know, the debate on, on uh, reducing the debt and raising the debt limit, he said that you know, if we give people a tax break, that is an expenditure for the government. I heard Dr. Key's lecture on that down at Morningside just yesterday. And he explained that you know, he, this guy was not only a minister, but he was actually running for president the last presidential cycle. Really neat guy. And he said for the government to say that, they recognize that all your income belongs to them. For them to allow you to keep more of your money, it costs them money. For them to raise their revenue, they simply take more of your money. It is simply systematic enslaving of the people. That pr the progressives and the liberals brought income tax into existence. Aren't you kind of glad about that? Also about the same time, aspiring attorneys... Back er, before the 20th century, all of them had to study constitutional law because every case that they had ever uh, litigated against, it all had to be compared to the Constitution. Since Woodrow Wilson and them changing a new paradigm, they study case law. And a lot of times we'll hear that a lot of times if you watch Perry Mason and they'll say, in such and such a case, this happened and because that was set as a precedent, that's what I'm doing. That never happened until they begin to take hold and move us away from the Constitution. Because if this case law moves away from the Constitution and gets established, and then the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one, you can't even find the Constitution anymore. They've done that. The cons the, they have changed the way that we study history, rendering it useless. In school, you find out the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. 
but you don't find out why. What was really going on in his heart? What was his diary? What, what, what were the things that he wrote? What, what was his vision of what he wanted to do? Because if you go back and you find what Columbus said he wanted to do, he wanted to find a new land to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't hear that anywhere. In that, because names and dates do not help you learn history. The reason why we have the Gospels, we call it his story. Well, what was the story of the founders of America? What was the story? What were their passions? Well, who really was Columbus? Who really were these individuals? What were their beliefs? What, what struggles did they grow through to help them develop who they were and what they believed? You, you don't study any of that. Therefore, if you don't learn from history, you are doomed to repeat history. And that's exactly what they have done. In fact, I've got a book here that used to be in public schools. It's called The Christian Life and Character of the Civil, Civil Institutions of the United States. This used to be a textbook in high school. It was out of print for 100 years. Since these guys took over, it went out of print and they stopped using it in schools. When this ministry tried to bring it back into print, from what I understand, the ACLU and several other liberal organizations took them to court to stop it from being reprinted. You see, you can't uh, use Orwellian tactics to modify history and have them actually bring back the original books to show that what you're proclaiming really wasn't the way that it was. This used to be what we studied. Now we, we don't learn history anymore. The Constitution is no longer studied more. It is considered antiquated. They make it a living document. You know what a living document is? Even though they said this, I choose to make it say anything that I want. By choosing, they've done it with the Word of God. I know God's Word says that, but in this day and this age, no, it doesn't work that way. They invented the concept of separation of church and state. Guys, that is not in the Constitution anywhere. It cannot be found. It can be found in one letter by Thomas Jefferson, but they take it out of context. It is not separation of state and church, it's separation of the state from the church. Because what he was dealing with is that the Anglican church was established and all the ministers were paid by tax dollars. And Baptist ministers were being thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. And so even though Thomas Jefferson was not a Baptist, he said, this is not right. There has to be a separation of church and state. The state cannot legalize a religion and fund it. There was nothing about, we cannot have anything of church in society. Everything about the founder, founders said the opposite. They took God out of public schools, and now we have war zones. They created 501c3 status to silence the pastors of America. They founded liberal education that has literally taken over all our universities. Uh, if you have paid any attention in, in some of the reports that are coming out, that our kids that are evangelical, they're conservative, they're Republican, whatever you want to call it, if they go to a university, if they speak out against the status quo of the liberal agenda, they may not graduate. And being an educator, one of the things for true education using uh, critical thinking is that you must be fair and unbiased and let all the different positions in a free debate without uh, worry of repercussions state logically why they believe what they believe with supportive documentation. That's not allowed in universities anymore in America. They have been slowly moving America away from a moral nation to a carnal and self-centered one. One of the things that you'll find out about the fathers, you know, some, some ministries try to say all the founders were Christians. No, they weren't. We had Christians. We had Jewish supporters. We had Masons. We had deists. We have agnostics. And we probably had a few atheists in there. But what they all agreed upon and what we're not taught in school is that before they developed the Constitution, the big debate was not whether to have a constitution and separate from Great Britain or not. The main debate was, are we moral of enough of a nation to have self-governance and self-reliance to be able to do this great experiment? And the answer originally was no. 
But then came the great revivals of Whitfield and Edwards, and upon that, they begin to, uh, the, the morality of the nation begin to rise, and you find people like Benjamin Franklin, who was a deist, he wasn't even a Christian, supporting Whitfield. That all of them, although they, they were not Christians, they had the utmost respect for the moral teachings of Jesus, so Jesus was held in high esteem, and so was Moses. That's why in the Supreme Court and a lot of different places, you have the Ten Commandments all over the place. All Christianity, as well as the deists and all the Freemasons, all agreed that the morality found starting in Genesis and ending in Revelation was the way that the nation needed to conduct itself. That's why it was, that's why the exceptionalism of America was founded. You take away our morality, you take away the basis of the word of God. The, these people actually told Chaplain Williams that we had to take God away from America to get this done. They've corrupted our theologies. They've corrupted our seminaries. They've corrupted a lot of the newer translations that we have, and they're very subtle. But they will use Westcott and Hort uh, for the Greek New Testament. One was, an, one was an agnostic. One was an occultist because they wanted to fundamentally change the way that the New Testament was translated. They used Hollywood to redefine the family, redefine beliefs, redefine our moralities, and literally have reshaped every other aspect of our society. A small handful of people, the Writers Guild, have done that. We're not taught critical thinking anymore in our school systems. And I just want to touch this to show you how it has affected the body of Christ. Can I do that real quick? There is a concept within critical thinking called intellectual humility. And now here's a quote from Critical Thinking Tools for a Taking Charge of Your Professional and Personal Life. Consider, for example, our tendency to accept superficial learning. Much human learning is superficial. We learn a little and think we know a lot. We get limited information and generalize hastily from it. We confuse cutesy phrases with deep insights. Now, how many times those that have hung around biblical life, you're, you're talking to other Christians, and you're trying to go back to the Word of God and explain something to them, and they say, that's under the blood. Cutesy phrase, define that. Uh, how do you appropriate that? Uh, have you done that? Uh, you know, the devil don't care about your us. The word says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Cutesy phrases are not going to have any impact on eternity. We get hit with kind of, well, that's under the law, or that's Old Testament, or that's this, or that's the past. Every one Christian that I have ever had hit me with those terms. When you really look at their lives, it's called a mess. Because there is no depth of insight or spirituality. We, we have reduced everything to catchphrases and to sound bites. So much so that the children in this day and age, our youth, don't know how to think outside of sound bites. It's impossible for them. How many know there has to be more depth than that? And guys, the list can go on and on. Now I want you to compare this to the founding time when the, when the founders formed our democracy. I've already shared that they, the great debate they had was, is a, is, is, were the colonies moral enough to handle a republic? Now notice I said republic because we were not created to be a democracy. Our founding fathers wrote that a democracy would always fold in on itself. That's why they set us up as a republic. It had to be a republic that the people were self-governing and the people had self-reliance. And they wrote the, 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 the uh, less moral the people become when they start going into sin, the bigger the government had to get to control the people because they would not govern themselves. And therefore, you know, they, they want small government, high morality, 
but they say when you have little morality, you have to have big government. And how many know that there are literally millions of rules and regulations on the rule books right now in America because they have stripped the morality out of the people in America? The founders had the highest esteem for moral righteousness. Now it's laughed at. This this shows you how effective that this is. How that they, they have literally moved America away from God. They've moved our educational systems not only away from God, but we don't even know how to think anymore. We've got to have somebody on the boob tube tell us if we're happy, if we're sad, or should we be satisfied for paying $5 for a gallon of gas. We, we got, they have to think for us, which is not the way that's found in the Bible. Didn't the Apostle Paul tell Timothy, study to show thyself, approve a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? We have forgotten that the highest form of worship Hebraically is study. Because if you know how to please God, then you can actually do it. Okay. Now, what, what the Illuminati have actually done is they have used the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans against us. Now, Jesus warned us about this in the book of Revelation. I want us to go to Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And I'm going to read a couple of segments, then I'm actually going to use some other references to define who the Nicolaitans are and what the, ba- the doctrine of Balaam is. Because how many know that all seven of those churches were not only uh, many dispensational ages within the church age, but I think it, it, it's a hodgepodge that deals with all the church right now, that you're going to find all the church and one of the seven churches. That it, it speaks to us all today. And he's picking up in verse 1, And unto the angel of the church of, uh, of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor, thy patience, and that thou cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and hast borne and hath patience for my name's sake, uh, has uh, labored and has not faded. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of, out of his place, except thou repentest. Now look at verse 6. But thou hatest, but thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, Now, Jesus tells us how he feels about that, which I also hate. Now, let's jump on down to verse 12, dealing with the church in Pergamos. And to the church of Pergamos write these things, saith he that hath the two-edged sword with, or the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days the Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So thou uh, also them that teach the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus again adds the emphasis, which I hate. That's twice that Jesus said it. How many know that that is, um, he's trying to get our attention to something. If you read the story of Balaam, Balaam was hired to curse the people of God, and, and God stopped him several times, and finally he went up and he was bound and determined because he wanted the gold, that he was going to speak a curse, and out of his mouth comes one of the most beautiful blessings ever spoken over Israel and all the word of God. In fact, to this day, in every synagogue on the Sabbath, Balaam's curse is spoken over the synagogue, because it, it is a powerful, powerful blessing. And so he knew that he could not directly attack the people of God. So he went to Balak down in Moab, and he said, you know what you got to do? 
you're going to have to send these pretty girls down there to seduce them, to get them to committing sexual sin, and you're going to have to try to get them to turn away from God's law and begin, to, and begin replacing it with the cultures around them, because if you can get God's people to violate the ways of God, God will lift his hand of protection off of them, and that he will begin to judge them. That is the doctrine of Balaam. And so the occult, ever since Balaam, have understood that someone on fire for God that is walking according to the instruction of God, they cannot directly curse. But if you get them to reject the ways of God and begin living like the world, they're like fish, they're like shooting fish in a barrel. And so you can talk about being under the blood all day long, and you can talk about having faith in Jesus all day long. But see, if you have faith, James says, I'll show you my faith by my works that I'm actually doing what God said to do, and I'm not doing what God said not to do. That is how my faith is expressed. We talk about the just shall live by faith. When you actually read that in its original context in the Hebrew where he was quoting it, it literally says that the, that the faithful... The righteous will live by his faithfulness, that he will be faithful to the covenant, which allows him to be sustained in times of trouble. And so they have corrupted our Bibles. They have corrupted our theology. I really believe that. Now, there are some good ministries on Christian TV, but there's a lot that you just kind of wonder, why in the world are they there? These people fund them to be there, to poison the pool. I really believe that with all my heart. Because if you get big enough, you even get bigger than the ones really preaching the word, then you become the model everybody else imitates. And so if you imitate perversion, that's what you get. Now about the Nicolaitans, and I want to quote first from Dake's Bible, and this is out of Dake's Annotated Reference Bible. He said, followers of, the, of Nicholas, a heretic, they are thought to have been a sect of Gnostics who, who practiced and taught impure and immoral doctrines such as the community of wives, that committing adultery and fornication was not sinful, that eating meat offered to idols was lawful, and this was similar to the doctrine of Balaam. Then he also begins to describe this movement uh, was one that attempted to take the Gentile portion of the church away from the instruction given to them by the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, verses 19 through 21. Now, let's, let's listen to this. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not from which uh, among the Gentiles are turned to God. What were they not going to be troubled about? The Torah? No. Circumcision. Aren't you glad that when we have a baptismal service, it's not followed up by circumcision? Now that, that to me would be trouble, okay? But we write unto them that they abstain from the pollution of idols, from fornication and things strangled with blood, a strangled and from blood, which is basic kashrut, Leviticus chapter 11. But then he goes on to say, and this, now everybody forgets this, from Moses of old time hath in every sim, sim, uh, city them that preach him being read in synagogue every Sabbath. So the, the last part of the instruction to ho the whole Gentile church was learn Moses on the Sabbath. We don't do that. Now I also, uh, the final commentary that I want to make reference to is the preacher's sermon and outline Bible. And if you're not familiar with it, it is they have taken all these works that I've got back here, uh, McClintock, McEachern, uh, Spurgeon, uh, McClintock and Strong, uh, Adam Clark, all of them, they have taken all the greatest commentaries of evangelical history and they have distilled it into a single work. So that you get, the, you, get, you, get, you get breadth and you get depth that prior to the um, progressives doing everything that they have done to mess up, I mean, we, we don't near have the churchmen that we used to have. Not really. When you read John Wesley, by the time that he was eight, his family had already had him memorize Deuteronomy. In the church today, very few have memorized Third John. <laughs> okay, and that was at eight. So I want to read to you 
what they say about the Nicolaitans. I want you to listen to this with an open mind. This is actually considered a Baptist publication, okay? Uh, they had stood, uh, let's see. I want to make sure I start where I wanted to start at. Okay, yeah, this is it. Uh, they had stood ever so strongly against the Nicolaitans. Just who the Nicolaitans were is not known. It is thought that they stressed two things. One, that Christ had done away with the law of the Old Testament and had instituted the law of Christian liberty. 90% of modern theology is based on that very premise. Okay. That the soul of the spirit of the man was far more important than his body. The result of this doctrine was clearly seen. If there is no law to govern us, then we can do what we like just so long as we profess to believe in Christ. And if the spirit is really what matters, then I can do what I like with my body just so long as I take care of my spirit. Modern charismatic theology. Next. Think how many people feel that they can live like they want to so long as they attend and support church. If they attend church, they feel that they can live like they want during the week. Think how many people believe that they are eternally secure because they believe in Christ and have been baptized and belong to a church, yet they live like they want during the week. They continue to seek the pleasures and passions of the world, banking and hoarding and neglecting the spread of the gospel and a world of desperate needs. There is no evidence whatsoever of repentance or of a changed and holy life clue, holy life, no evidence of self-denial of the sacrifice for all one is and has. The point is this, the Ephesian church had preached and taught against the heir of the Nicolaitans. They had refused to allow the heir to enter into the church. They were doctrinally sound. They stood staunchly for the truth of Christ and the word of God, but they lacked the one main thing, love for Christ. They had lost their love for Christ. Now, how many with what I just read, that is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, makes up about 90% of what you hear on Christian television today? that's preached from our churches, that the minute we bring up, the Torah defines what is holy. And you can't live holy without knowing what holy is. And then you got to do what's holy and stop doing what's unholy. Now, I want to show you just how much the elite have taken the church away from the truth in the last 100 years. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Well, brother, I know Jesus. I've been a member of this church for 40 years. I tell you what, I'm the biggest tither. And if that preacher doesn't preach what I like, I tell you what, I pull that bad boy right back out of the offering plate, I tell you what. Okay, let's see what the Bible says. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, I want you to use a little logic. Who's Jesus? He is Almighty God come in the flesh. Jesus spoke the Torah to Moses, and Moses wrote it down. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But he, now he, he goes on a little bit further. Now, he, now, John gets radical. This apostle of love gets radical. He that saith, I knoweth him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Well, I know Jesus. Really? Do you discipline your life according to the ways of God, or are they optional? If they're optional to you, you do not know him, according to the New Testament. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. So the only way to get perfected in God's love is to learn how to walk in the commandments by the Holy Spirit. Whereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. What would Jesus do? The Torah. Okay. He did. He lived it perfectly. That's why he was the perfect spotless lamb of God. Now John goes on in 3, starting with verse 4, 1 John. Whosoever committeth sin, 
has violated the creeds of the Baptist church. Oh, assemblies of God, I'm sorry. Isn't that assemblies there? What is it? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. The cross did not change that. And we know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoever abideth in him sinneth not, and whoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, he that violates the Torah, is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this pur purpose was the Son of God made manifest that he would destroy the works of the devil. Now, that won't preach in many churches anymore. Now, I want to compare that to the final farewell address of George Washington to show you the contrast. One of the things he started out with saying is that we are a moral and we are a religious people. And in his discourse, if I may, just bear with me just for a moment. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, Religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. What pillars of happiness? Morality and religion. These firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. The mere politician equal with the pious man ought to respect and to cherish them a volume could not trace all their connections with private and public fe uh, felicity. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for prosperity, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths, which are the instruments of investigation in the courts of justice? Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be ma maintained without religion. Moreover, may be con uh, conceded to the influence of the refined education on minds of particular structure, reason, and experience, both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in the exclusion of religious principle. Sounds to me like George Washington said the reason that this republic stood was because we were a religious people that feared God and that we were a moral people. Can you see how that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam have literally, some of the things that we're seeing happening to America now is because God has had to take his hands off of America because, because we are not a moral people anymore. Not only are we not a moral people out in secular society, in the church that claims to be blood-bought and blood-washed, we are not a moral people anymore. We have bought the lie. It is time to take that lie and to shove it back in hell where it belongs and pick up the word of God and begin to live it again. Now, one of the things that has come up in my spirit, we have been teaching on covenant faith here for, what, the last nine weeks. And in dealing with Abraham, when he had to make, take up an army to go against the four kings. The Bible says that within his own household, he grouped together the trained. And I mean, there was anointing on that when we taught it. And in the body of Christ and with biblical life, there are the trained. And what's interesting is that he said that there were 318 within his household. And God began to speak to me, and this kind of refers back to my military days, but I want to see created Unit 318 of believers across America that are going to begin doing what I share tonight and begin doing what we're going to share in subsequent weeks. The first thing that we need to realize, guys, with this, with, we, with the Nicolaitans and with uh, the doctrine of Balaam, is that our spirit can get contaminated. Now, one of the things in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that Paul prayed he said, may the, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if the spirit could not be tainted, the apostle Paul would say the spirit's taken care of, but what I'm going to pray is that your soul and your body be found blameless, that it stays sanctified to God.
but he did not. He said that your whole being, your spirit can lose its sanctification, your soul can lose its sanctification, and we all know about the body, how it can lose its sanctification. It can also be contaminated. We need to realize that our spirit can be poisoned, it can be wounded, and it can be put to sleep. How many of us know believers at one time in their life that had keen spiritual awareness? They, they, could, they, could, they had discernment. They, they could hear the voice of God. But then they go through a cascade of events and different things that happen in their life, and they begin to fall away from God, and the first thing they lose is discernment. They used to know when the devil was up to something, and they used to know when God was up to something. Now, either one of them could walk up to them with a, with a pink polka-dotted tie, and they still wouldn't recognize which one it is, and sometimes they're calling God the devil and the devil God. It's because something has happened to put them to sleep. Now, let's, let's go to Proverbs 15 and 4. And how many know everything of the world is to put you to sleep, to contaminate you spiritually, to get you to where you're more drawn in agreement with the world than God, even if you're born again and spirit-filled? Now, everybody always talks about the first part of this verse. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But perverseness therein is a breach in the what? In the spirit. Perverseness in Hebrew here is salif, which means crookedness, perverseness, and crooked dealings. Do you know that when the devil gets you to cuss, it can wound your spirit? Did you know that when you allow perversiveness, pornography, or whatever it may be, not keeping God's word, it not only brings sin to the soul and the body, but it breaches, it creates a crack in the protection of your spirit and begins to poison your spirit any time that you have, as a believer, done crooked dealings. Let me tell you something. I have been ripped off by more believers than I have sinners. They don't know that they're, they're, they're hurting their own spirit, man, that they, they are not keeping themselves in sanctification. And it allows the world and, and, and demonic influence to flow into their spirit and into their, uh, into their soul and into their bodies. Now, the word breach here in Hebrew is shabir, which means a breaking, fracture, crushing, breach, crush, ruin, shattering. that it can shatter your spirit, that it can crush your spirit, that it can run your spirit, that it can break your spirit. Have you ever seen a believer whose spirit was broken? No longer had a heart for God anymore. But I've been always taught that nothing can ever affect your spirit once you're born again because the Holy Ghost moved in there. Well, how many know the Holy Ghost moved into the temple in the Old Testament and the, and the chabod of God, the glory of God dwelt there? But then eventually they allowed enough paganism into the temple that God says, go ahead and write Ichabod over the doorpost of the temple because the glory has departed. The Old Testament temple is a type and shadow of you. The Holy Spirit wants to influence you. He just cannot manifest his presence because of what you have allowed in and what you have allowed to shatter and fracture and break and crush your spirit. And then all of a sudden we have prophets start starting to prophesy for profit. We have preachers that no longer preach the word. They preach what is popular, what brings in the crowd. I would rather preach to the remnant than to the whole world. The Bible says better it is to be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. What can we do to, to change this? And this is something that we have discovered. We can repent. We can return to the ways of God. And we've also discovered that we can begin pleading the blood of Jesus over our spirit and asking the Holy Spirit to restore. 
When's the last time you ever heard that? I've never heard this before. I mean, for, now, there may be other preachers out there preaching it, and if you are, God bless you, you know. But I've never heard this before, but every day I, I, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, let the blood of Jesus cleanse my spirit, cleanse my soul, and cleanse my body. And then I'll let this word also empower my spirit and cleanse my soul and establish the code that I'm to live by. One of the worst testimonies in the world is a believer without a code to live by. And God wrote down the code for us to live by. So we need to do that daily in our own lives. If you do that, you'll find your spirit man comes back to life and you get to the place where you, you instantly pick up on the garbage of the world. The second is sin. Now, sin is not only to breach your spirit. What we have found, and this is not only dealing with the Illuminati and the occult, and we, when you have witches come after you, begin to do some digging and find out what's going on, that they use sin and the sin nature as a power base for their activities in a society. That's why in the Old Testament, if a community would not turn from the occult within Israel, they were to burn them out because they would use the sin of that community against the people of God to take over. We need to daily ask God to forgive the sins of America, to plead the blood of Jesus over them, and to ask him to, to petition heaven to break the power that they have established with all the abortions, with all the murders, with all the sin that's going on in America, that its stench has reached up into heaven. The Bible says that God had to judge a people because there was no one to stand in the gap. That gap does two things. It begins to petition heaven to forgive and to repair, and it turns and tells the people to repent and get right with God. We don't do either anymore. It's time to return to that. We need to call sin, sin, and we need to take this in. How many know that does, does not abdicate someone's uh, need to ask for personal forgiveness? That I, I can ask God to forgive the sins of this whole area and break that occultic power, but if a sinner dies without Jesus, how many know they still go to hell because they're responsible? What I have done is broken over the blindness that is over the area and the occultic power that has kept everybody in slavery so that they can hear the gospel. Yeah. Nobody's doing that anymore. That is something that we have got to make as a part of our spiritual discipline to do daily. Now, here's another one that we don't hear a lot of, justice. Now, Christians talk about justice when they want some justice, <laughs> you know, when they want to take another brother to court over something because he's not actually doing the commandments. But when it talks about God and justice, all of a sudden, Christians get worried. I, I have went into places that I begin to speak of divine justice, and everybody's face turns white. Well, see, if you have cliches instead of actually living godly, if you have sound bites instead of a lifestyle that will take a bite out of the devil, you'll turn white and get scared when you talk about justice. But see, when I'm in Jesus, I was judged once as dead and guilty, but I embraced the cross of Christ, and that blood covered my sin, and then I was judged in Christ, and I live on his track record, and now that I'm there, I'm required to live according to his track record. So if I'm not playing with sin and not playing with the world, I can cry out for divine justice and it can fall all around me and not touch me. Now I want to show you something very interesting out of the book of Revelation. And this is Revelation chapter 12 starting in verse 10. You know, sometimes we, uh, we miss out a lot by not being able to read Greek and Hebrew. You know what I mean? And it says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So we, in fact, earlier in the word of God talks about Satan being the accuser of the brethren. That word accuser in the Greek talks about a prosecuting attorney appearing before the judge. Every time that you sin and follow the way of the Nicolaitans and follow the way of Balaam, 
Satan can appear before the Father and say, I have a right to do this in Mike Lake's life because he's doing this and this and this. I have a legal right. God's court operates on legal terms. That's why it took the blood of Jesus to pay for the sin. He just couldn't forgive it. It, took, it required blood. When we quit sinning, and we do what's in the next verse. The devil gets thrown out of heaven. Get out of my court. Why? Right now, he's up there, guys, by himself. There's nobody on the other side pleading our case but Jesus. When the Bible says that we may boldly enter into the, into the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy in a time of need, that we can with boldness come in there. We never come in there because we're too busy playing with sin. But look what it says. It says, and they overcame him who the accuser by the blood of the lamb. How many know what that means? The word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and them that dwell in woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath. Of course he has great wrath. He is kicked out of heaven. This is not talking about the fall of Lucifer when he sinned against God. Because it, it is set in a court of law. If we're in a court of law, and I go up there to give my testimony to the judge... We think this is about testifying to other people about Jesus. This is about going before the court of God and say, this is what the devil has done. Now, I am crying out for divine justice here. In fact, the Greek word there for testimony, and it's Strong's number 3141 if you want to look it up. It means a testifying, the office committed to the prophet of testifying concerning super, uh, future events, what one testifies before a judge. When we start bombarding heaven by coming into the court of God, giving testimony to what the devil's trying to do to our nation, what the elite have tried to do to this nation, and come in by the blood of the Lamb and live like we're covered by it and begin seeking the face of God, crying out for justice, Satan will be cast out. God, instead of judging America, can begin judging the elite for what they have done to a nation that was originally established as a righteous people who believed in the code that he said to live by, whether they were a believer or not, that taught about righteousness in their schools. The very first reader ever developed in America was developed to teach people how to read the Bible. The reason that Noah Webster developed the Webster's Dictionary is he defined all the words as defined in the King James Bible so that everyone would know what those words meant so as society grew, they could still properly interpret the Word of God and live by it. You're not taught that in school either, are you? It's not right for them to work us like puppets on a string, control our finances, control our resources, control our lives. They have set themselves up as the new pharaohs on the earth. And I know what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob does to pharaohs. But he did not do it until his people begin to cry out. It's almost like the Matrix. They have made a prison for your mind. You're a slave with the illusion of freedom. I want to be free. I want to have a nation that my grandchildren and great-grandchildren will have the freedom to walk with God and to make an honest living. These people since the 1950s have moved almost all industry overseas to dismantle America. They won't let us tap our own oil. And from what I have been told, in just one of those reserves, just one of them, if we would take out 10% of what's in one of, the, one of the four 
And if, and if oil is $100 a barrel, it would pay off the national debt. Oh, no, we can't have that. What they want to do is they want to collapse America, turn us into a third world nation, and then come in as heroes. So all of a sudden now there's oil discovered in America. When it's already on the congressional record that it's there, as well as the law that forbids it to be pumped out of the ground, well, we need to take up arms. You need to take up the arms of the Word of God. If we don't handle this spiritually, there is no physical force that can stop it. The only thing that is going to stop it is divine intervention. The Word says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll come and I'll heal their land. You see, the elite are not called by his name. Ninety percent of the politicians in Washington that are actually funded and controlled by these people aren't called by his name. We are. That's what makes America different. We are. And if we will daily commit, and we're going to get into some things in the next several weeks, the, the videos, and I'm believing I'm going to be able to put one out every other week instead of once a month to get this out of things that we can do to begin turning the tide. If we'll do what we can do, God will do what he can do. But we have got to meet his criteria. We have got to know how they came in. We've got to know how they got it done, and we've got to reverse the curse. We've got to go back and do the first works. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And the church has lost its love, which is reflected in how it treats the commandments. Guys, it's time. Father, I just pray right now that every person that listens to this message, Father, that you would light a fire in their spirits to take up spiritual arms. Father, right now I pray for everyone. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over their spirit, man. Father, begin to repair the breaches. Begin to repair that which the enemy has crushed, the enemy has shattered. And Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit would begin moving on them to rebuild their spirit, man. And Father, let their soul and their bodies be subject to their spirit. And then, Father, let them renew their soul to the Word of God and to live by your ways, to honor and to bring glory to the name of Jesus, we ask. We thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.